Greetings, Cosmic here, and welcome back to another Battle Spirit Saga video. And today I want to talk about something a little different. As of now, we are well underway to the False God spoilers. We have, I think, as of this recording, we should have all the spirits now, and we should be going to Nexus and then Magic to round out the spoilers. But we have been given a very clear sign on how we're going to see a major change to how Bandai develops this game compared to One Piece or Digimon. Now, I won't speak about Dragon Ball Super strictly because I am not an expert in it. I did not play it. I have not followed it as closely. So just for the sake of being fair, I shouldn't talk about it. So I'm not going to. It's not meant to be a slight to anyone that plays DPS. It's just I don't know, and I don't want to spread any misinformation about it, so there, there's that one caveat up front. So for those that maybe have played Magic or have maybe played other games that have this style of format, you're going to kind of already know what to expect throughout this video, but the long and short of it is we're going to have blocks, and blocks are really exciting because it makes sets that build off of one another. So before I get into kind of how it differs from One Piece and Digimon and the price impact and all that other stuff, I just kind of want to like highlight why some of the cards kind of got us there to this conclusion and kind of what it means for again going forward and what future sets might have so to start things off we have heavenly gate guardian clavis now again this is a card that at the time of the recording we haven't seen the magic to be fair but we do know that some of the best cards coming out of well the luster package which this is going to fit into is all in set one so things like michaela things like angelic pressure things like exhaust nexus right there are things that we're still going to want from set one to build off on this and if we think about just how few magic cards yellow is going to get in set two compared to set one because again set one was more of an introductory set every color had equal share we're now green is getting more of the share in set two it's a very limited pool that we're going to have uh, the opportunity to play with but then also this card in theory at least gets better as we get more and more sets now uh, to be fair it is an eight cost it only has three reduction there's a lot of things i don't like about this card to be fair from like you know what did we have in set one and, and kind of luster and what did the magic spell you know kind of uh cards need and it's cool that it says select one spirit and then return all yellow magic so yes there's a case where you can splash like a bunch of different three drops and then still get back angelic pressure there's like weird scenarios where that comes up or gives you a little bit of flexibility. Obviously, it would have been banned immediately if it said any magic, right? Because then you just loop absolute ice shields. And otherwise, like the best thing that you're doing with this is Michaela to get back exhaust nexus. Now, again, yes, small disclaimer. Maybe we get some new absolutely insane magic um, in set two for yellow. Spoiler, I doubt it. Exhaust Nexus is like one of the strongest things that you can be doing spell-wise. Um, so them doing more than that would be kind of insane. Uh, but then again, that goes back to, okay, well, what spirit does that give us? Oh, it's Michaela, which is a seven drop, which is in set one, right? So very clearly, this is a card that does, uh, you know, almost completely nothing by itself, but gets boosted a lot by set one. So this was kind of one of the already the key flags that we had about how this was going to develop. Going on from there into another example from Purple, the Dark Knight Lemurak. This is a self-destruction now style archetype that we're getting in set two. Yes, Crimson Mail was in like the TP promo, which like, yeah, that gets you there sort of thing. But we're going to be missing out on cards such as Deadly Balance and Nemesis, which is clearly, it's also a shadow for crying out loud, Abandoned Guillotine, if you want to throw that lens into it, right? So there are still a number of cards from set one that you're really going to want now obviously in set two we did see more of this self-destruction kind of archetype or build uh, expand on it and i would be i am dead set guarantee that we are going to see a magic and or nexus combo that fill into this strategy so yes things like nemesis will likely still have a home uh, and, and be relevant kind of one variation of this deck or another same thing with the band guillotine but we might see more of a departure where we have two different versions of the same self-destruction type because then you still have like you know deadly balance and you can do things like beldegore into looping your graveyard and then you have like a self mill and self-destruction package built in one right we'll see how this goes but it is another card that it is not great by itself and there's a lot of support in set one now, getting into more of like, yes, it's set one stuff, but really kind of more of it's set two, right? This is kind of where it gets a little bit muddy is the Ted Sword Saint Starblade Dragon, right? Awaken as a mechanic didn't get a lot of love in uh, set one, right? We have Mars, but like Mars probably doesn't even fit in this deck anyways. 
We have some of the Lord of the Ground Awakened Spirits, which probably okay, right? This is more of like a Star Dragon thing. And of course, we have Seagworm. So like that is a nod to Nova. They got a new Seagworm to play with. A couple cards there. But ultimately, this is a deck that's like, okay, you probably want a couple cards from Red Set 1. But a lot of this is going to be far more heavily specced on Set 2 stuff, right? Where you really want to see what else we're going to get from the Nexus of Magic cards to enable this X-Rare. So, right, we started from Clavis doing nothing <laughs> by itself just to be blunt about it getting a little bit more relevant with dark knight and then ten sword saint obviously getting a little bit more here where it's like okay this really does have to be something that's focused on in set two and you might need like big bang energy but that's like 10 cents whatever sort of thing right um seagworm is a nod to nova and then of course to be fair overall we do get completely new archetypes in set two nothing in set one Small disclaimer, like Dream Bomb and stuff, right? Nothing in set one that we know at the time of the recording, based on the Netric Nexus and Magic Yet's reveal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's nothing in set one that supports this outright. Now, again, white being uh, you know a defensive color by nature, getting kind of this more of this token spam is an interesting lean on it. To now where we have some you know things that can be unblockable, things that can help us draw cards, right? Bouncing stuff refreshing stuff there's a lot of different aspects that could play into this from set one but at least of as of right now trickster machine god loki is saying like hey take me and my what was it four support cards i think that we saw already jam all of those into a deck that is like your baseline and then from there say okay well maybe i need one or two things from set one just to round it out obviously you need absolute ice shields suppression could also be good if you're just trying to stall out um it's again really interesting because we don't have something that really loves this design space and says hey i really want this archetype right there's nothing in set one that screams that um but again wouldn't be surprised if we see a lot of nexus and magic support and then of course there might be something that ties together like green white token so shout out to like you know selesnia tokens for those that know if you know you know um but we have the ant tokens we have the machine tokens and maybe there's some overlap there maybe not who knows uh this is definitely one that remains more to be seen so a lot of that just is kind of very high level obviously if you don't follow battle spirit saga closely um you'll just kind of have to take my word for it you know i mentioned a lot of different cards but there really is start starting to see this massive massive separation between how they treat digimon in one piece and how we are seeing battle spirits saga develop and well to be fair it's ex expected, right? We do have Battle Spirits devs on the team working on Saga. And spoiler, if you look at Japan meta, at least right now for the last three blocks, math's hard. Um, I think it was uh, three or four blocks ago is when it finally confirmed over. Like they used to do like five and six block sets. And now it's, it's a hard four, right? So it's always going to be a one year cycle of like, here's your block. And then on the next one, obviously contracts was the big one. And for us, what that means is, hey, it, we might start at a lower power scale and get things like uh, Rush, which is a long story short to say that dual color cards matter or having two colors in your deck matters. Or if they want to kind of like just jump right into it and kind of have a noticeable power bump, we'll probably see Braves first in uh, set five then. Uh, had to do quick math there to say like, okay, we want to introduce a new major mechanic. And with it, of course, is going to bring a little bit of a power bump to it. Now, again, going through the spoilers to date, um, again, ignoring green because green is a new color. Green has to have catch up. And I'm not going to spoil too much of that in this video. I'm going to save it for a future video where we talk about it. A lot of the spoilers for yellow, purple, red, and white are just okay. Very, very okay. And that's fine. They don't always have to immediately power creep like we see in the other Bondi games from time to time. And it does give players who say, man, I really wish, you know, dredge was or self mill slash dredge was more of a thing. Spoiler, you get that in set two. So it really feels like set one, two, and three. Again, set three being the introduction to blue. We're going to see more of this same pattern repeated where it's like, okay, give everything kind of like a flat slight level up like you know give it up one or two point lift instead of the 10 point lift that we see in like digimon in one piece and really have more options with within each color and i'm super for that right having more deck diversity within the colors is a huge huge win so i'm really excited to see you know for example with purple we're going to have the you know purple standard core control we're going to have the purple self mill with the mortal stuff going on we're going to have the purple shadow archetype which is all focused around self-destruction and as we build out the card pool all of those are going to see more and more cards added to them which is then just going to further separate them apart right because one of the biggest issues in set one is a lot of the decks in purple for example 
are the same. And the same thing with yellow. A lot of the decks, it's just they're very samey because of how good certain cards are compared to others. So all that out of the way, kind of a long introduction. Where does that leave us? So let's talk about Digimon really quick, right? Um, huge shout out to Eggman just using his website as an example because it was super easy to pull this from uh, his website just to talk about the metas overall, right? So we have going from one meta to the next, and I did just a very quick look at, you know, top 16, what topped, what didn't. And I highlighted there on oh, that side, whichever way the camera's pointed, that side. Um, I highlighted really quick, just like uh, Black War Gray Man X, right? Did very, very well, was a top deck in one set immediately chunk down in the next and then you can look at some of those other decks which are just not there at all now i do have to give the obligatory shout out because someone's gonna call me out on it but like oh yellow hybrid made a top list and that's from like bt7 or 8 or whatever it is and they're on like 12 now sure there is always going to be like that fringe outlier deck that is still going to be you know somewhat good i think their record was x2 right which you know um it, it is a lot of room for decks that could land in it but if we're talking about the ultimate what is competitive, what is topping, what is winning, and just focusing on that. Digimon as a game is really, really punishing for that. The, the fact you just have to buy a new deck every single format. I think there's been like one where it's like the EXO whatever sets that are like low power and don't matter, but at least for every mainline set, you have that issue. So as somebody who played uh, Shoutmon, right? That was the last major uh, Digimon deck that I played. I started in uh, BT7 or BT8, excuse me, played through Shoutmon and then obviously played right up until uh, Battle Spirit Saga launch. It is very much the problem of, hey, I played Shoutmon and, you know, there's going to be some prices, uh, you know, out there that you can look up and it's just, hey, I doesn't do anything anymore. I'm going to throw it in the trash and be done with it. And that's just the way that Digimon as a game has been designed for multiple years now. Same thing with One Piece, although arguably this one is a little bit worse. Um, one Piece right now has a major issue and you can go from set one. I'm just highlighting set three here just to really prove the point. You know, set one started off, we have a lot of the other cards from purple and blue and green, which just get thrown in the trash again. Red is uh, a little too good to say the least, if that's not entirely obvious by the pie chart over that way, um, and needs to be banned. That said, if we look at the other stuff that's been winning, um, you know, and it might you might make the argument like, oh, once Whitebeard and Zoro get out of there, the meta, meta might open up more, older leaders come back, what have you. But we've seen this in Dragon Ball, at least a very little bit that I looked into it. So I say I wouldn't mention it, but here's like the one line I'll add about it, right? With leader-focused games, you always have to push a new leader, which then has new cards to go with that leader, which then invalidates all the previous cards that you had. So obviously, I know someone's like, be like, oh, well, what about Zoro? What about Whitebeard? What about all these overly powered red cards that just keep coming back? Well, yeah, no crap. They're way overpowered. Of course, they're going to be, they, they need to be banned. I don't know. Everyone who plays One Piece will tell you this. Like, there is a major balance issue in One Piece right now that is, well, only getting worse, just to be blunt about it. So that said, if we ignore the red side of it, right, throw that in the trash, just ignore that for a quick moment. Um, we can see things like Smoker and like the Kazans that were $60 at launch, you know, really want to play uh, Smoker, really cool. Down to 20 bucks, irrelevant, bad card, nobody plays it, it's garbage, throw it in the trash, your $200 deck, invalidated, gone, boop, done, right? Never going to come back, never going to see play again, it's irrelevant completely. That's just how it's designed. That is one piece because either it's an IP game, they have to you know push the new Luffy, the new Zoro, whatever. It is by design as a game that just wants to keep recycling set after set after set after set after set and keep you buying the product, which, hey, that is one of the positive sides of this. It's really great for moving product, right? That is a very real positive for keeping the game afloat. People have to buy product. And if you make the previous set completely worthless, well, that's the way to do it, right? Um, obviously, that's not always going to you know, be the most respectful thing to the players to do. But if it's cheap enough, then, hey, you probably don't matter. You don't uh, or don't care. It doesn't matter to you that you have to buy, you know, $80 worth of staples, right? It's whatever. It doesn't matter. It's a very low cost compared to other trading card games in the market. And that's why it's fine, right? So we'll see one piece. I just had to mention because I was somebody who played it. I saw the way the meta was going immediately. Not for me. Um, and also just game design stuff. I don't like how simplistic the game is. That's a whole other video topic, whatever. Um, but I just had to mention it here because it is seeing that same problem. Now, I did want to give up the one example of the Shaomon deck. This is something that I have uh, played. I didn't play it the X7 version. I just played up to X4. Uh, because it was right before this dropped is when I quit. Um, and again, this is a deck that, cool. You can look on TCG Player. I think the most 
most expensive that this deck was uh, from like just launch, big hype, everyone was playing it. It was 40 bucks, right? So sure, what does this look like? Now, all that ranting out of the way, we now have an established kind of like level. So for Digimon, right? There, it, well, Digimon's at least cheaper than One Piece right now because of, you know, stock issues, XYZ for One Piece, right? But let's say in a perfect world, things are kind of flat on the ground. They have a similar price band range where let's just say it's $40 to about 130 for uh, Digimon and One Piece. You are now spending $40 to $130 depending on what you play, what support they get, if they have secret rares, stuff like that, every single set. And then when the new set drops, you say, cool, I loved you, Shoutmon, into the trash you go. You're never going to be relevant again. Um, or if by some insane uh, miracle like Black War Greymon, they get like random support, one card jumps up to like, you know, $20, but then the rest of the deck is like 10 cents still, right? So like there's there's no value in any of this, really. Um, a lot of the value for Digimon in One Piece is really going to be held to the alternate arts. That's kind of what you'd expect from a collector's based game or one that borrows from an IP and has a collector focus, right? So yes, it's a good and bad thing that it's, you know, Digimon as a game and One Piece as a game is super easy to jump into, play the deck, right? Spend basically the cost of a video game to enjoy something for three months. And I will always say, I think Bondi did an okay job with that, right? It's really player friendly to jump in and just enjoy the game. However, that does bring us back to the point of Battle Spirit Saga. So what's different? Now, getting into the other side of this, right? We talked about how great a $40 deck is. Play it for three months and you're happy. Well, on the other side of this, we have things like Absolute Ice Shield. For those that don't know, this is a staple in Battle Spirits and Battle Spirits Saga going forward. It is, I would bet my bottom dollar, it's not getting reprinted in set two. Spoiler, it's not going to get reprinted in set three maybe it'll get reprinted in set four or they will do it in like the lore set for like a special or actually no, the lore sets are all new cards. So that won't work either. There might be some other product like a premium Bondi, right? Where they do a special version of it, maybe an altar or something. Who knows? But the point is, this is a card that's going to continue to be a staple and continue to be a four of until it's reprinted. So this goes all the way back to what I was saying for set one and the importance of it, right? If you think about, I just want to play red, well, just buy a red split. Now, I'm not going to tell you to go buy the vanillas because that's probably not needed, but I just went ahead and said, okay, what does every card cost from red? Uh, on the, and this is obviously at the, the highest end of it because you're not going to need all those vanillas and other snuff sh that I threw in. It's $80, right? So it's $80 to make sure that you have every single card from the color that you want to play going forward. And with Absolute Ice Shield... Yes, you got to figure out what time is the best to buy these for you because, yes, it can be a little bit difficult to say, hey, I want $60 for this, you know, play set, and then I still have to buy the rest of the deck. Now, spoiler, the rest of the deck is saying like, hey, I have to spend $40 or $50 at most because of like Gagano to finish the deck. Like, that's not that expensive. That re Really, that just brings us to the top end of the one piece and how expensive their decks get, and I guess some Digimon decks, to be fair. Now, to be said... The important thing here is that, yes, we do, as I mentioned at the front of the video, we do have things like Luster still being important, Nova being important, or I shouldn't say important, but like getting more support, right? So the other side of this is that for the new set, unless you're playing green and we'll likely see the same pattern in set three, unless you're playing blue, you're going to spend like 20 bucks, get all the new cards that you want for your deck and be fine with it, right? You like, you might not need to upgrade your deck or care about upgrading your deck until set three or maybe even set four when that like, like next major uh, key spirit comes out that you really care about. So there's a very interesting dynamic that happens here that I think a lot of people are still, if you're coming from Bondi games specifically, you see a $15 card per, you know it's going to cost you like 60 to 80 bucks, let's just say as a price range because this card keeps going all over the place. And you might be thinking to yourself like, oh, if this is like other Bondi games, I'm just throwing it in the trash every single set, right? And that's 100 to $150, right? Because again, depending on which uh, color you're buying into and all that stuff, like, oh, that's way more expensive than Digimon in One Piece. Why would I want to try this new game? And that's just not true, right? That's like the biggest barrier that I see for the game, at least for people who are so used to how Bondi approaches things. And now that we're seeing such a major divide to Battle Spirit Saga and what it means going forward that, you know, a 60 to $80 staple means a lot more in Saga than it does in any other Bondi game. And I think like that's a key part to internalize and see where it goes from here. Uh, because again, you know, smaller price point updates for if you're thinking about 
you know, buying into green in the next set, you're not going to have something that's like absolute ice shield. It'll be cheaper then. But once you get your ice shields, you're definitely good. And it's going to have a much lower entry point. And again, you can kind of keep upgrading your decks piece by piece every single set. Because if you're someone who just really wants to play Nova, for example, congrats, Nova got more support. Based on the lore and what we've seen already on cards, Nova's probably going to get more support in set three. Like it is something that they're going to continue to carry out through the rest of this block whatever they end up calling it or whatever it ends up being, but likely these decks will be the major themes that we continue to see until set five. So where does that leave us, right? Where is the now negative side of this? So it can't all be good. And I did want to, you know, flip the coin and say, okay, I have to be fair. I have to talk about the other side of this, which can be very negative. So Battle Spirits as a game is very good about making old cards relevant the bad news is they can get kind of expensive. So the Three Wise Gods here is out of stock at 40. It's not at all uncommon to see these double X rares go for 50, 60, 70, 80 dollars, right, in Japanese battle spirits when they get random support three years later. Now, the thing I'll note here is this is a double X, which would be the equivalent to a secret rare in, in the Western version of Bondi's games, which we don't have yet. So it is one of those things where like we might see uh, certain cards that spike in playability because they're an X rare and they're just very good, but there's significantly more X rares that are open than double X rares. So I think we're good on that side of it. So at least for now, we don't have to worry about this, but this is a very, you know, potentially negative thing that if something gets support, now we're talking about decks costing you know, 200, 300, 350, because we need these random old cards. Now, to be fair, I know that just sounds like a lot. Huge disclaimer here. It is getting reprinted. So Bondi does do reprints for Battle Spirits and we'll likely see the same thing for Saga. It just might take, you know, a little bit of time to catch up. And I know I was talking to uh, Asperia and some other people in the main Discord, like, yes, DBS did have reprints as well for like some of their promos that got really expensive. So the good news is they are open to reprints. The bad news is, you know, we don't know if this is going to happen to Saga or not yet, but just something to keep an eye out where it's like, you know, secret rares when they release, or at least looking at current prices on YYT right now for Battle Spirits, they're like 10 bucks or less, right? Like if you're worried about that, if you think they're a generically good enough double X or secret rare, just buy them, sit on them, get your play set. Don't have to worry about it later. Right. That's kind of like the obvious place to go from there. And then the other side of this is and just to give a shout out to shadow versus uh, evolve because it's launching next week. There is the case where we've seen now that Merlin is, um, pretty good a year and a half later because Merlin as a, uh, it's called a legendary, which is equivalent to X rares for us in saga and other Bondi games being super rares. But it is out of stock everywhere, and it's, you know, 20 or more dollars where it was like three bucks on launch because it's now so far released out of print. And it's just there's no more copies that are going to get into the market, right? So Roomcraft players, I guess if you're going to be picking up Shadow vs. Evolve, please, I am begging you, buy your three Merlin. She's literally good now until a year and a half later. Uh, set six that they're on in Japan now. And what's interesting is we did get a similar card. So with the Arbitrary Deity, this is the one green card I'll mention, there is this focus where your key spirits in battle spirits are normally meant to be like, this is my finisher. This is my big card that I want to have my big playoff for. But now armor tree, he's the only one that does that. So now we already have a card that is very locked and says like, Hey, if they ever do, was it carapite and insectoids or the, you know, bugs, right? The bug archetype. If that ever gets more support in the future. And if they want to expand on that spoiler, you're going to have to buy armor tree. Like they're not going to print a randomly better armor tree in set three or set four, or probably even set five, right? Like this is a generically really good X rare that is probably going to stick around. So when I was like working on this video and creating, I was like, holy shit, like this is a, this could be a problem because there's, you know, that is a very, very strong, unique effect that they're not going to repeat. And then of course, like the ramp is like, whatever, you don't care. You're going to leave this guy at level three, Give, the, give your entire deck swift, which is a very strong keyword. So we kind of already have this, and this is like the first X rare that kind of does that thing. You might want to argue like Michaela as well for like the magic side, um, but it like we will, we still have like Shin. And there's still like other things that you can do within that archetype where Armor Tree is like, no, literally this is the only guy who's going to enable certain play patterns in that specific deck. It is a must buy for that archetype. So. I am very curious to see where this goes uh, from here. 
So what does this mean? What does this really look like? Well, the good news is, as of right now, as of the time of the recording, what's available on distributors page, as of set three, there are no secret rares or double X rares in Battle Spirits Saga. The other side of this is we know set one was printed into the ground because of the launch events and because of other things that Bondi had going on internally. Spoiler, set two is not going to be printed into the ground. Set two is not going to have this massive surplus that we see for set one. And I guess, you know, kudos to Bondi for the foresight that they knew Absolute Ice Shield and some of these other cards are going to be such strong staples that we're going to need set one cards well into set three and four and five, right? So I'm glad that we have that, but set two now begs the question of like, well, how much product is going to get opened, right? Thinking about Armor Tree, yes, it's only an x rare Yes, a lot more of it will be open, but if somehow the bug arc flash archetype you know, the bug's life, I guess, is the joke that's going around. If that suddenly gets playable and not a lot of people open set two, that's going to be a real problem by the time set three, set four, set five roll around. And we're going to see that Merlin issue where now we're suddenly paying, you know, 20 to $30 for what should be a $10 card. So, uh, you know, I do strongly feel that double X rares or uh, secret rares should come to Saga at some point because it just puts more value into opening boxes, which is what stores need at the end of the day. Uh, but at least right as of right now, it's not out there. It, we might see it with set four, and we don't have to worry about it just yet. But if we do, I strongly encourage you to, you know, get get them and buy them early if you can, if they are generically good again, like Death X and just to name a random Digimon card that saw way too much play and was like $100 because it was... He was just that guy. So um, with that, like I said, this is just a topic that's been on my mind for a little bit. I kind of want to just a longer video, just rant about the you know decision points here and, and how Saga is fundamentally changing how Bandai is treating their games and what this looks like going forward. So very, very excited to see uh, what's around the corner. So with that, again, I will be in Ohio this weekend. So the videos might be a little delayed depending on when we're getting back and all that stuff, but very excited to see everyone at the event. Um, still have no idea what I'm playing and all that stuff, but hey, you know, that's a uh, tomorrow me problem. So with that, my friends, stay safe, stay hydrated, and we'll see you in the next video. Cheers.